previously, we're working from the top down, but once we get down to actually where the work is really going to be taking place at our school sites, what does that look like? And so we're going to be working with 14 schools and then we're gonna sum up our next steps. So I'm going to turn it over to, you know, Mr. Mir who does a great job and um, he eased my pain. So <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mir, you can take it over. Thank you. Great, well, welcome back everybody to our, our session today. As, as Dr. Rim said, we wanna get some uh, ideas from you. We'll do some brainstorming. We'll take your ideas, bring it back to you. Uh, for that district piece, and we'll keep moving on that um, pilot piece that we've got going. And we're going to start by having Sheila remind, remind the group of how this got started, what the vision was, and to also um, introduce some new folks who are here with us today. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, we do have a, a new member or a member that has been able to join us today, Dr. Brinson. Um, so welcome, Dr. Brinson. I think you'll uh, recognize most of the names and participant names, so we won't go through introducing ourselves, but we're glad you're here and we hope that you uh, feel free to contribute and um, just be a part of the team. Thank you for having me. Okay, so <clears throat> we started with a, a key leaders meeting and this was um, back in Gosh, now I know it was the end of November, beginning of December. And we introduced the idea of a, a family, a district family engagement team. And they either decided themselves to be a, a part of this work group, or they assigned you as a designee. So we just wanted to remind everybody of that purpose that we, we got to this point, maybe not ever sharing with this group these objectives. These objectives were shared with the key leaders group, but we wanted to bring us back. We got kind of um, excited and off on the reading recovery project. And so in tandem with moving that forward, we wanted to bring this group back to some of the object objectives that we originally had for the, the district family engagement team. And we're gonna be addressing a couple of those objectives today, but I, I will share this bullet um, document with all of you in email format afterwards, just to, to keep us all, um, I don't know, focused on what we want your contributions to be a part of. You know, we, we could sit in our department in the Office of Strategic Partnerships, and we could come up with some pretty good ideas and strategies for achieving these objectives, but we formed this group and want your input because across the district, your input, you know, yours and, and you representing your department, this will be richer. We will end up with a, a, a richer group of strategies, a, a richer vision. We will move forward in a way that we couldn't have done on our own. So we're, we're hoping, you know, that's a, a, certainly a, an accomplishment today. I'm not gonna read all these bullets. I'm gonna go over the ones that we're gonna talk about. One is that we want to very much develop a vision for our Pinellas County Schools family engagement. And of course, we want it to be aligned to our district strategic plan and our bridge the gap plan. And we want to develop systems to monitor equitable family engagement. So the idea today is that we're going to try to define what would equitable family engagement really look like in our district? What's already happening? What needs to um, you know, be a, a, a strategy or a, a new objective there? So the rest of these are things that we'll continue to work on. As we meet, we'll continue to, to feed it back to the, the key leader group and hopefully, um, you know, knock off some awesome objectives here. Anyone have questions for Sheila about the original or the, the larger focus of the project? Hopefully that's what was communicated to you by the person who um, elected you to be with us. And, and we're really happy that you're here today. And the first thing we wanna do, if you haven't uh, had this opportunity yet, is to, to do a little, um, uh, we're gonna to go to a, tr a tried and true elementary school strategy. We're gonna create a word wall. And so in a minute, we're gonna ask Sheila to put up the whiteboard. Everybody should be able to write on the whiteboard. If you haven't done that um, on your toolbar, there should be something, a little pencil that says annotate. 
And if you choose to annotate, you'll get a set of tools when the white bar comes up and you'll be able to write on it. And what we're looking for, uh, as Dr. Brim uh, leads this effort to uh, strengthen the PCS policy around family engagement, part of that policy is, is, is the vision. What is the vision for family engagement in the district? And we've been talking about, you know, we did some, some discussion of what is best practice. We've been talking about that. And today, what we want to start with is using this word wall, getting the words from you that you think are essential, the critical, those, those really important words that need to be in the district's vision statement about family engagement. So Sheila, if you could turn on the whiteboard. Okay, Ron, you need to stop sharing so I can do that. You ready? Please. Okay. <laughs> All right. Oops. <laughs> These so are our clear out the whiteboard. There we go. All right. So if you can't see the annotate tools up at the top of mine, mine says you are viewing Sheila Kane's screen. And next to that, it says view options. And if I click the carrot by there, annotate is a choice. And you should get a menu that says mouse, text, draw, stamp. If you choose that text tool, um, we want everyone to write on it. So just very quickly, I want everyone to use the text tool and just write their name so we know people are able to use it. So you can write with the pen or you can use the text tool to write your name. So we see Connie, Sheila, Nancy, Kyosha, Oh, partnership value here. Okay, so there is, I see um, Demoris. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and clear the board. Actually, Sheila, I think maybe you have to clear the board. All right, now, what we want you to do is put, create a word wall and let's put the, the, the words on there that you think are critical to have in the vision statement when we think about what is the PCS vision for family engagement. Yeah, I saw that Dr. Brim had written co-partner, but it went away. Yeah, so um, there it's back. Angela wrote success. Equal partnership, okay. But the success and open. What um, can you talk? Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure what the open means. Can you, whoever that was who wrote about open, can you talk a little bit about that? If you're talking about it, you have to unmute. I'm not sure. Who's our person who wrote open? I think that was Angela. Angela, okay. So tell me a little yeah, bit. Sorry. Right. That's okay. There you are. <laughs> I was trying to find my mic. Um, okay, so like openness, kind of like open door policy, open, open so that parents feel like they can come to the school and they can um, engage with anyone at the school. Um, I guess maybe that was just too much or a bit too vague. No, that's good. That, that helped me. I'm just making a few notes here. Perfect. Okay. Um, solution folks, I think, who wrote intentional? Dear. Is that oh. you, Dr. Brim? Yes, that's oh, me. I love that word. I just want to, do you want to, can you speak a little bit more to intentional about anything in particular? Okay. So when I, oh, I'm sorry, let me mute my phone. When I think about intentional, meaning our efforts is just not random, that there is a targeted component that we're being very deliberate about what we want to get at. And so in a vision or in a statement that we want to do as a district wide, it needs to be, when I say intentional, it needs to be really laser focused. Okay to the outcome. So thank you very much, Dr. Brim. Who is our student-centered person? I don't know if I click on that. That's me. 
of that, is that Kyosha thing? That Kyosha, was, yes. <laughs> talk a little bit about how the family engagement policy would be student-centered. What do you mean by that? So in keeping in mind that, you know, the um, importance of our student success and student achievement, making sure that the parents, um, the all stakeholders, the parents, the teachers, that we all understand that at the end of the day, our focus has to be on student-centered learning, making sure that we are doing what's best for all of our students, reaching them where they are, and assisting our families in doing the same thing. Great, thank you. Uh, who is our community stakeholders person? That was me. Um, sorry, I was. You meant by community, who 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 fits in that group, or what you were thinking? I, I was. I just think that sometimes we, uh, rightly so, I mean, focus on the family, but we need to make sure that our, our family engagement policy and in, incorporates the community. Um, that supports our families. So community partners, agencies, um, faith-based you know, organizations, uh, that we all have a stake in um, you know, authentically engaging our families to support student achievement because you know, the community wraps around our schools and our, our students. And so they need to have a, a voice as well. Uh, Amy, did you just write part of Instructional Core? I, I, yes, I did. Can you just speak to that for a minute, what you had in mind? Well, if we're really going to really do this as a district, I think it, it's just as important as um, all the essential things you'd put into developing um, you know, your leadership, your <laughs> instructional components um, to really support you know, I think it, sh it shouldn't be just like an add on in the side corner. It's part of the one of the main pillars that the district would see as a, an equal Got it. towards like the instruction. And then yes. had you written that earlier? Is that underneath family? Yeah. Course? Then I realized what I was doing. I was like, well, oh, I got to move perfect. my little dude <laughs> learning curve on that. Uh, so here's your last chance for anybody to put a word or a couple words on here that you'd like, and then we're gonna, uh, we're gonna do a little stamping on these. So any, uh, oh, trusting, I like, who's writing trusting? I like that one. Me. <laughs> so what I'd like you to do is go up to the annotate tools and there's a stamping tool and you can choose a heart or a check or a star. So I'm gonna choose my heart and I want you to stamp two or three words at the most that you think are really important. Okay, I like it. All right, so what, uh, if you haven't done it yet, use your stamp, you can use the star, the check, whatever you like, uh, and uh, take a second to do that. We're gonna save this window. And after today, Dr. Brim and team are gonna use this to construct a vision statement that will come back to you uh, for your input, feedback, approval, um, in this process. And in just a minute, we're gonna do another aspect of the policy. And, and we'll walk through all the parts of the policy this month, next month, to make sure that we have uh, consensus and good wide input from across the district into the first draft uh, that, we'll, uh, that they create. Okay, Sheila, are you ready to save that? Yes. Okay. Ron, can I just ask a question uh, regarding a term that I see that I'm not Absolutely. I'm myself, I think. Oh my gosh. Can you see me? Can, I mean, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Um, the word convenient. Oh. I, I don't know. Could someone explain the word convenient? Whoever um, put it on the, the board. Sure. Sorry, that was me. And I was just more thinking of the time constraints that sometimes parents <laughs> and teachers face. 
and that a lot of times events are held when parents are working or parents want to meet when teachers are working and so okay. finding I guess time would have been a better way to word that okay acceptable Thank you. might be another word equitable I was gonna can you hear me I was gonna say mm -hmm. equitable opportunities like we're not just saying they have to come to us we could come go to them uh, so as you were talking Jennifer about convenience was it convenience for everybody more convenience for families more convenience for staff did you have any particular thought that way I mean I was thinking families at first um but you know we have to think about teachers as well and so if there's a way to work out the hours so that it could work for everyone and they're not feeling overstretched and they're not feeling like it's a burden then they're more open and receptive to meeting the families and the families are more able to go if it's obviously conducive to their schedules. I don't know. <laughs> okay, fantastic, thank you. Any other comments, questions before we save this and move on to our next discussion topic? I'd just like to add to that, I'm thinking flexibility on, on um, for, for all the partners, some flexibility in, in scheduling and, and participating and providing, maybe that word helps. Flexibility in scheduling and participating. So Ron, when I consider differentiated implementation of engagement practices, that will be under the umbrella of equitable? Mm -hmm. Okay. Got it. That was a clarifying question. Okay, thank you. Yep, absolutely. This is uh, great. Well, thank you very much for getting uh, getting us started and thinking today about keywords, key important concepts that go into uh, the vision, but also go into, as Dr. Brim was talking about, the practices that we have to uh, put into play throughout the district. So I, I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. While you're doing that, I want to welcome Dr. Webley. Um, and apologize uh, to everyone. I don't know, I, I'm gonna make sure that we don't have to worry about that passcode in future meetings, uh, but I'm, I'm glad it didn't prevent anybody from actually attending, although I, some of you had some um, challenges. So welcome, Dr. Webley. <laughs> welcome, Dr. Webley. My name is Ron and I um, am located in Iowa. I don't know if you can see out my window, but we have about two and a half feet of snow out there. It is snowing again, and this weekend on Sunday, the high temperature is going to be minus seven. Wow. Anybody feels too hot in Florida and the <laughs> guys that wants to come and shovel, come on, join me in Iowa. So we we're going to get to 80 today. Yeah. Oh, um, I need to be there. Um, and I, I, I actually feel terrible that I did not start with a graphic to commend you all on being Champa Bay. So... Well, I imagine folks are pretty happy down there. Because we all had so much to do with that, Ron, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you're so, Ron, I also want to just kind of just the highlight of Dr. Brinson. He is over our, um, he's our chief achievement officer in our district. And Dr. Webley um, is the chief transformation zone um, area superintendent. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I know that... Um, Dr. Brimman came got to talk to you prior to this meeting, and we have lots of good information now about what's going to go on in the uh, pilot project, which we're going to talk about at the end today. So Dr. Brim uh, mentioned that um, we want to get to some specific steps, some strategies, some implementation ideas uh, that can go into the policy. And as we've talked about this work so far, we've really uh, last time when we were together, we really talked about four groupings, four areas. And we want to just go through those one at a time today. As we, and we're just going to actually ask you, you can type in the chat box or you can unmute and share. Um, so the first of those four areas is ensuring that we have both educator and family voice represented in what goes on throughout the district uh, with these partnerships that you just described the vision for. And what we want to hear a little bit about, and I'm going to take notes here, uh, also to let you know in case we didn't say that, that Sheila is recording the meeting so we can make sure we capture everybody's input. Um, what would this look like throughout the district? What strategies would help us get there? What would this look like? How, would, how can Pinellas ensure 
that as you put the policy into practice, educators and families have a clear voice in the process. Um, Ron, one of the things I think is a clear communication system that's two way. We do it episodic when we need the voice of our families, but if we have, I, I mean, I know we have a strategic communication department that does a phenomenal job, but as far as the knowledge to our families, how this communication works, the knowledge of every staff member, every teacher, how does this look and how is it equitable? And, and I think, you know, I don't know if I- How would you know if the system was equitable, if your two-way communication system was equitable? What would you see or hear that would make you say, yes, we were there? Okay, so there, okay, so just say for an example, um, we want to communicate something regarding instructional core. That in that communication, I don't have to take the information, send it over to Dr. Carrick to communicate it in Spanish. I don't have to take this communication. I don't have to go to each department to inform them. It's a system that automatically happens when we hit the send button Every communication department get this, this information. It automatically transform into all the different languages. So that would be one example for me. And so that would be the information going out. That's one way. The, the two way means there's an opportunity for it to come back then from families as you think about that and anybody can respond. Um, what would that, how would you know you were there? What would that look like so that families have the opportunity to um, have the information come back and be valued, acted on, used? There is a high level of trust and you build a relationship where they trust you, you trust them. When you speak, they listen. When they speak, you listen. Dr. Brinson, is there anything, in, uh, any particular strategy you would use to um, encourage widespread input from families or community coming back at the district? You know, when that trust is there, how, how can you ensure, are there ways that you can encourage um, a wide range of voices to be reflected in that? Well, I, I think you start out by um, tapping individuals and then you move to uh, group meetings, group settings, and you move to breakout session, you have to allow every voice to be heard and respected, regardless as to what they're saying, regardless of the input, give them a chance to be heard and listen with sincerity and empathy. And once parents see that you're listening, not just in the room, then they'll be more inclined to stand up and speak up mm -hmm. and share their true feelings without feeling that they're uneducated, unheard, and misrepresented. I like those words, listen with sincerity and empathy. Do you think that is something you, uh, the district does well at this point? No. But an opportunity for growth, for some uh, helping staff throughout the district be able to do that even more effectively. Yes. Okay, I'm seeing. Uh, what is an SAC? Sheila wrote SAC. Our school advisory um, councils. Each school has a, a school advisory council. And when you think, think about those individual buildings and the schools, I, I'm thinking about my work in other districts and wondering that uh, I was on a webinar yesterday and I hear this phrase all the time and they say it's always the same families. It's always the same families. We need more families, we need a wider voice. Are there, are there thoughts about um, how on those FACs or at the building level, uh, particular strategies, in addition to what uh, Dr. Brinson just said, to really ensure that it, it is that, that all voices are represented? Well, actually, yes, because they have uh, very specific 
roster membership compliance strategies they have to meet. Um, the, the SACs have to mirror the um, ethnicities of the area the school is actually uh, residing in. So um, not only does there have to be a certain number of um, parents or community members, it has to be more than 50% parents and community members, and then it can be also school or district staff, but also then in the ethnicities, uh, we, we have to mirror within plus or minus 10% of the community that the school resides in. And schools do that. They, they put a roster together and, and get you know members, but I, I really want it to follow the spirit of the School Advisory Council rather than just the compliance piece. I, I'm not sure past the forming and the membership whether you know, each school, some, some do, I'm sure, some don't. Um, you know, I want it to be authentic, so. Um, I see Dr. Rinson says the SAC is, is a little formal. Um, are there, can you, you think of, in addition to the, that formal mechanism that is prescribed and uh, they describe the composition who needs to be there, informal ways that the district can really support uh, that the wide voice? And again, not just from families, but also from educators, because the educators have to be engaged in this and we want to make sure that they are, um, their voice is heard in that joint, that collaborative process. You know, Tracy just mentioned how we take the advisory council and connect it to their community. But I wanted to add to that where you asked about an informal process. We have to really study how our stakeholders and our families communicate. And I'm just going to give an example. The majority of our leaders, including me, are baby boomers. Mm -hmm. so you try to cross generational gaps to the millennials, to Generation X. You have to really study how they operate their voices and incorporate some of those key pieces in your way of work. And, and if I understand you right, Dr. Brim, when you uh, become more aware of those various strategies, making sure that uh, whether we're comfortable as baby boomers or not, we start to employ those um, effectively. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, that's it. So one other question before we move on. So we talked, you were talking about getting this voice at the building level. What about educator and family voice at the district level? As you make district decisions about family engagement and doing things at the district level, how do you ensure um, robust input from those groups at the district level? I'm going to chime in because I feel like that's part of the compliance piece for when I have to develop the parent and family engagement area of focus in our title and application. And I do two very authentic, so the opposite would be unauthentic. I feel like parent meetings where, you know, it's, I think just now, like I'm learning so much more where it would be me standing up in front of a group of parents and not me being eye to eye with the parents. So I would see that would be unauthentic. Um, and just really, I don't feel like I have a relationship with family. So why would they want to come see Amy Brown? Who is she? So that's kind of like a barrier. Um, so it is hard to get feedback from families. When I do have the groups of parents together, and I think especially when I did my Zoom in the fall, I felt like it was a much more, we had a thing, much more genuine conversations because it was, you know, it was a more safe space and it was more engaging. Um, so I think if I, you know, hopefully when we do go back face to face, I will change my practice of how I conduct those meetings. And, you know, I don't, it's not Amy teaching in front of these parents. It's their part of it is they're co-creating this document. The, the dialogue, and that was, yes. Not a monologue. I see Correct. Dr. Kinsey has written, it's about immediacy. I think uh, it's a really relevant point that um, when there's an issue, we need to be able to get that input in a really timely way to make decisions. The other thing I see schools uh, struggle with or, or, or reckon with is how you define what voice means. 
Um, for many districts, it means we ask what your thoughts are, you give us your input, and then we decide on our own what we're going to do. And one of the questions for Pinellas is, um, is it possible, are there ways to have that be a joint decision with the stakeholders, not district deciding for, but district deciding with? Uh, families and educators and other stakeholders. Does that, does my question make sense? I, I saw Nancy shaking her head. Um, so instead of doing to, it's doing with. And uh, any specific thoughts about how that might happen differently than it happens now? Or, or does it happen now? I think that's our ultimate goal. I, I, I think it happens episodic, not Decide, okay, decide, decide with instead of for. Okay, great. Okay, so first area, educator and family voice. Um, the second work group we've put you all in is to talk about, you know, nothing happens without a plan. So having a clear plan that drives the work both at the building and the district level. What, how do we, how do we ensure what strategies, what would work uh, so that the, everyone in the district, everyone in the building is clear, you know, what their role is. What is my role as an educator, as the administrator, as a parent? What do I do? What does it look like? Um, what happens when, who does it? And how do we know anybody, is anybody better off as a result? And I think um, Ron, Hillary and um, Lucy, who are, who works on the equitable, the, the equity team in our district, um, I'm, they were unable to attend. So I do think, can I ask, or can, do I know if this is a conversation that they've had within their own work? I'm quite sure it is, but you know, going back to that communication piece, I'm, I'm unsure of what has been implemented. So I think um, we'll be hearing back from them as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know if um, Dr. Webley or Dr. Brinson has, you know, seen anything in this, you know, in the district as it relates to family engagement, and equitable practice in a plan. I don't know about Dr. Brinson. He and I talk quite a bit. Um, I haven't seen anything other than what you guys have brought us. Some of our schools have their own plans they're doing, but nothing district-wide. Dr. Brinson, what about you? If it's not there currently, what what would it what would we like it to be? What would we like to see? Is it, for example, integrated in something else? Is it a separate plan? What is a, what is a strategy or a way that that um, would live and be something that is useful as opposed to just a piece of paper that's, you know, filed away? See, I, I go back to some of the comments Amy made. It needs to be integrated. It doesn't need to be compliance. It doesn't mean need to be a, it needs to be integrated in our work that, okay is part of the thought process when we're planning, is thought is part of the discussion with our families, with our teachers, with our staff developers, our professional developers, our executive leadership team. It is actually embedded and integrated in our work. So Dr. Brim, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna push you or ask the group to be a little more specific on that. So I, I do know from, I'm a baby boomer with you, what gets reported on, particularly shared with the board and the public, is what gets done. So when you say integrated, where where is it? Where would it be written down? What would it be integrated with? Um, I just want to chime in. Part of like what we're doing with Title One is we have we have to do an application. So they've pushed it up to May. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to work with our schools. So they have to do a Title One school wide plan. Well, what comes before that is their comprehensive needs assessment. And we revamped that and it really speaks to parent and family engagement. It really makes them open, really how are we using parent and family engagement as more of a strategy. So I think we're getting there um, to really, it's embedded in their comprehensive needs assessment and they haven't, 
hasn't been rolled out yet. So it's right. gonna, you know, it's new, but I think that's part of the step. It has to be part of the planning process. That would be in a Title I school. Correct, there, but everyone has to do a school improvement plan. Yes, yeah, so how would you do that in a non-Title I school? How could you make a similar thing happen? They would have to, I think when they develop their school improvement plan, um, there are steps that take yeah. place. I, I've never been a leader um, in a, 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 a principal's. I don't, I don't know, but I just I know Title One and what the steps are. So Title One building does it because the federal law says you must. Um, Correct. Would they have to do a Title One school wide plan? Correct. Okay. But yeah. in school. Well, no, I want to just. I'm sorry. I want to interject because Miss Kane and I have participated on the school improvement teams as they build their plan, there is an equitable, I'm sorry, equity piece in all of their plans that's spearheaded by um, Hillary Van Dyke. But not once did we hear in our dialogue across Title Ones and um, regular or general ed schools, how does this look as it relates to families and stakeholders? and parents, I, I, I didn't see a drill down response or plan to that. You know, one of the things that I think need to happen, um, and not just in Pinellas, but by a lot of uh, school districts, since we're talking about educators, is that there should be a system-wide, high-level customer service training. Because you see, Every interaction matters, no matter which level or uh, where it's coming from. You sometimes only get one opportunity to make an impression. And if you blow that opportunity, you may disconnect that parent or that child for life. If there's no one else to reconnect, they say, because sometimes they come there thinking that we don't care and we don't listen. And if the first person they interact with confirms that, then you lose them. So I think you have to start with teaching people how to make everyone that they interact with feel like they're the only person in the world. And so Dr. Brinson, you have foreshadowed the, the next area and I, I brought it up on the screen. So if I understand you right, you're talking about building the capacity of staff, the adults throughout the district at all levels to ensure the interactions are um, welcoming, open, uh, that encourage relationship and trust, not do something to discourage that. Uh, so I'm hearing some systematic or system-wide training initiative focus on that piece which fits in with this third box. I wanna, I wanna keep that conversation going. I just wanna throw back as, um, and today is really the start of this conversation. When you think back on the plan, um, some districts uh, take, you know, when, when Title I, federal law has mandates around family engagement, so we do it because we must. Um, there are some districts that create processes for all schools that meet the, the spirit of Title I, but something that everybody does. And so to think through that kind of a needs assessment that Amy talked about or other pieces, one option is to consider what is something the board might require everyone does that certainly meets the Title I requirement, but meets this your vision for what equitable family engagement looks like in every building. Um, and part of that, Dr. Brinson, is really thinking through what, what do we need to do to prepare the adults throughout our system? So we just heard one thing, this sort of customer service welcoming piece. Are there other things, other strategies, key things that need to happen around building the capacity of adults throughout the district? Any particular group, uh, any particular uh, effort that would make a difference? If I may, um, so I keep thinking about the new Let's Talk that's, um, been um, implemented and how powerful that seems to be. It, um, and also thinking about the Florida Department of Education ESE Parent Survey. And I think those are two opportunities where if we had like a cross-departmental review or monitoring like systematic, where every department's looking at it and seeing how that, what processes or things they have in place that 
they could be looking at that child because I always say to families and, and teachers and everyone, our children are general education students first. So when you talk about um, equity, um, so if we're all looking at it and seeing how that piece of that situation could be looked at in all departments. So I, that was just something. I, I love your phrase, cross departments. So I know we've talked about this before, really getting the folks represented here in your departments to, um, in a more systematic way, do those kinds of reviews, do that examination, do that collaboration. And that's something that could clearly be mandated or put into the policy that it a way that not only is it required, but it's reported on. So I, I love that idea. Other ways about building the capacity of adults throughout the district uh, to make sure that we have these equitable partnerships with families and, and stakeholders. For customer service, we have the cross department review on things like the Florida Department's parent survey, the data aligning uh, mm -hmm. as Tracy just shared. Um, other ideas? I'm just going to throw this out there. I don't know if this is what you're going with, but like um, hiring practices, like that would be a question across the board. I, don't, I know each school is different and they do their, how they want to hire, but if we really wove that into teacher onboarding and training and um, first year, wove, first wove that or wove it, what do you mean by it? Uh, teacher training, new teacher training. I know they do a first year training or they have a support or a mentor, but I don't know if that's, if there's any parent and family engagement component to that. So ensuring that new hires, um, teachers early in that process are getting some professional learning around best practice in these partnerships. Is that? Correct. Okay. And a lot of our teachers don't come from traditional four-year colleges. Um, I don't even know if they do have parent and family engagement. Like I said, this is, my training was so hundred years ago, I didn't. Um, so even if I was to be a new hire in Pinellas County, that would be something um, that I would have learned from. Well, right now there's a group, a national group that is studying that very thing with a uh, big grant to look at what are universities and colleges doing to prepare incoming teachers. And soon we should hear the preliminary news is they got exactly what you got. Nothing. <laughs> So Ron, I think it's very important to embed it in all of the um, principal trainings. For example, at our superintendent's meeting, after Dr. Greco is, is done, our principals divide out by level and they talk about instructional core, best practices. And I just think that should always be in there in the forefront where they are including their families, uh -huh. integrating that in all of their practices so that they hear it. Um, the area suits expect some level of report out on it. Um, I think it needs to be part of the evaluation piece. Oh, cause that is really how we're gonna get out, get at moving students to the next level who are not self learners. Mm -hmm. Building on, on that, Dr. Brim, um, and looping back to Dr. Brinson's comment about, about customer service training and really a customer service mindset, um, I, I don't know that um, we have done, well, no, I do know. I do know that we haven't done a sufficient job of um, stating the customer service mindset as an expectation of how we interact with people. So. Um, in my experience, um, I often run into situations at schools where we take a, we take a very compliance oriented thing and we take a very authoritarian uh, tone toward parents and students. And um, we, we don't take a, a, a customer service uh, heart, a servant's heart toward, towards it. And, um, and, and and I, I think some of that is just the expectation that we are customer service agents here, folks. Um, so I like, Dr. Closet, that you're saying you could lay out clear in this policy, clear expectations about what is minimally um, acceptable and making that very clear and articulate that. 
so the last piece, which we're not going to get to today, uh, we can, uh, we, we will, can again, I this, ask, can, oh, I'm sorry, Ron, I don't mean, can I, ahead, Dr. Brim, we'll, we'll give you the final thought on this. No, 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 I'm going to kind of ask the final thought on that to come from Mr. DeMorris, who just made a st statement of our district expectation most of the time for that comment he put in the chat. Uh, would you like to talk a little bit more about that, Mr. DeMorris? Well, um, oftentimes the front office staff is the one who generally deals with the public and the public comes in and asks to see someone get behind um, the black doors. The front, front office staff is often the ones who interact with the general public most often. So the expectation is for them to have that customer service. Oftentimes, how a parent or the community deals with that front office staff often reflects on what they think about the school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it can go to it beyond that uh, to if your child gets on the bus or uh, often as a parent, we would go up late and try to get something out of school. We would see the, the, the janitorial, the custodial staff who would let us in. And, and we have lots of interactions with, uh, you know, we often think about professional learning throughout the district or teachers or administrators, but there are all those other groups that have the same interaction. And, and Dr. Brins and I couldn't agree with you more. It can be a very quick interaction that causes um, a disruption or a, uh, you know, a bad relationship with the school for a very long time. It can come, uh, as you were describing, from a, a, a small interaction with huge consequences. Um, as That's we, true. We, we always, we have our family-friendly schools training and it's really only promoted to front office staff. And <clears throat> truly, I mean, you could have the most friendly front office staff ever, but if your child's classroom teacher doesn't have that mindset, or if the school counselor who's, you know, has some interaction with your child and, and needs to loop you in, doesn't have that mindset, you know, et cetera, et cetera, then it, it really needs to go beyond, <clears throat> you know, where we're marketing our, our class. And that's part of our back to the objectives was to create a professional development plan across the district. So I'm happy to hear you say that, Dr. Brinson, that, that you think that would be, you know, having some kind of required, you know, professional development it, it would be amazing. To go with Dr. Colosi's clear expectation of this is what we should see and hear and having some way to measure that. I think those are great ideas. The, the last group is what we would do and how you build into the plan as a district, how district folks build the capacity or not build, but enhance because families already have capacity and enhance the capacity of uh, families at home to, to support their child's learning. And we will be able to get into that more particularly as we do this project and that uh, brings me to, as, as I'm watching the clock here, um, we're gonna ask, she, so, so thank you for those initial thoughts. We're gonna take your, your ideas, we'll draft a vision, we'll start coming up with strategies uh, uh, that can be, uh, that are equitable and can be laid out in the policy and come back to you for your feedback. So while that district piece is going on, we have this fantastic opportunity that uh, the district has offered to try out some of this stuff um, in some pilot schools. So uh, Sheila, would you like to give folks a quick update on uh, what we know about those schools uh, and when things are going to happen? Sure, yes. So we've, we are moving forward with the, the Reading Recovery Project. Um, we've had several good meetings. We've assembled the, <clears throat> excuse me, the data, gotten the student names, gotten the uh, family names and contact information. What you see here is a, an overview of the number of students that are receiving the intervention one-on-one -on -one, uh, or in a group and whether or not that school is, a, is in the transformation zone. Um, the enrollment is the, the total school enrollment, not the first grade enrollment, even though the program or the project is only for first graders. So I might add that um, data, the first grade data in there for the next time we look at this. But, we have put together a, a one pager, the overview of the project. You all received that um, kind of as an FYI. We just want you to know that your input is being used. We put that one pager together, have a timeline now. I'll show you in a minute. Um, the one pager was attached to the reminder that you got for this meeting. 
So in case you want to look at it at some point, if you have any questions, we have met with Dr. Webley, we've met with um, Cassandra Murphy-Atkins and Holly Slaughter, gotten our ducks in a row there. We have a scheduled meeting with the uh, lead teachers next week. And then, you know, you can see as the, the timeline rolls out that we will be communicating to principals, helping them form a, a family engagement team, doing some training with the, um, the actual school-based reading recovery teachers, and then helping them design some family capacity building sessions. It's, it's all happening in this, this pilot. And at this point, we just wanted to make sure you knew that we were moving forward and we're gonna circle back probably at the next meeting and, and get a little more input as we roll down this, um, this timeline. But it, it's very exciting. We're very excited to, to try to see what, what works, right? What, what works in the way we're doing things and how we're approaching it. And what doesn't, um, you know, what new ideas can we come up with that can then be, you know, taken as we, we roll it out across the district, so. And as we do this, for example, the ideas you just shared around those equitable practices, I'm thinking, for example, uh, Dr. Clothy's expectations about interactions and Dr. Brinson and, and DeMoris' comments about training staff how to do that, this becomes, um, an incubator these 14 schools, a place where we can try some of those things out, see if they work, see if they don't work, uh, but also as you participate with these schools uh, to generate additional ideas that can inform the policy as we move forward. Uh, Dr. Brim, as we uh, get ready to close our meeting today, a question for you, would you like to share with folks um, uh, any thoughts about expectations for their participation as we work in the pilot project? How we'll be reaching out to them. We have those, um, we have the four groups that you all gave input to last time. Those are the ones we just talked about. So supporting the, the creation of teams at the buildings, helping with strengthening that relationship that Dr. Princeton talked about so important, um, building the capacity of staff in the building to do this work well and to connect this to learning and then ultimately creating opportunities for the staff in those buildings, uh, particularly with the reading recovery families to uh, enhance the capacity of families at home. So any, any closing words uh, before we end today, Dr. Brim? Okay, so thank you, Ron, and thanks, thank everyone for participating today. One of the key things that we want to um, build upon is relationships. And so we know that part of you have great I mean, many of you have great relationships with these principals. So as we began to implement these pieces, as we began to talk to our principals, just in your conversation with the principal to make sure that they are connected to the work, that they're connected to where we're going, particularly in the 14 schools that we're talking about. One of the things that we wanna be very careful about is that we're not pushing work out on you, but yet and still, we need your assistance in this work. So what does that mean? One of our goals is that we create a family engagement team at every school. If you have a particular work interest in either one of these schools, it would be great if you wanna be on a on one of the engagement teams? Or how do you go about adding to the connections and the partnerships and, and, and connecting to families if you have strategies, if you're connected to staff developers? So it's all about that connection piece and it's all about getting your input so that we are doing this collectively so that as it rolls out, it is being, you know, done by a, co a collaboration of people that are not only doing the work, but are in key leadership roles that will make the difference than this, make the difference of our work being implemented with fidelity and excellence. And so- Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Brim. I think that sums it up. And I don't know, Ms. Kane, you have anything you wanna add? Sure, just to say, you know, circling back to where we started with the, you know, how did you get here? Where did we start? Where are we going? 
those of you that were kind of appointed or you know designees from your department key leader, we just we would ask that you you know try to circle back to that key leader and make sure that you're keeping them updated with with what the group is accomplishing, what are we working on, you know what are some of the things we're we're thinking about um, for the future because that together with you know what goes on here that's how the silos are going to break down. You know, you're, you're here. I mean, not just, we want your input representing your department, but we want you to take that information that you've gotten here, you know, back to your department and, and share it out so that we can continue to, you know, make inroads. Um, we can't have, you know, everybody from everybody's department in every meeting, obviously, but, you know, that you are representing your department is, um, you know, hopefully an expectation. And that's all. I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. If we are at the end of our hour, I want to be very respectful of your time. You're probably all off onto another meeting that starts right now. Uh, look for between now and the next session, uh, draft vision language, draft strategy language for your input feedback. Um, so we can come back to you next month with uh, a, a pretty good first version of those two pieces and we'll keep the conversation going. Also look for, opportunities to participate in the pilot project in those 14 buildings. Thank you so very much. Enjoy that 80 degree weather. I'll enjoy the eight degree weather here. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Take Thank care. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for joining today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, everybody. Huh. Okay, it's just a... that I thought. Well, what do you think? Yeah, we, we, Dr. Brim and I have already chatted with each other about how excited we were, how that was going. <clears throat> they have some good ideas. They, they're absolutely on the right track. I, I love it. Mm -hmm. And Sheila, I can't believe like how you just sat on that family friendly workshop. I was like, oh my gosh, we have that, but no one knows about it, you know, and I know it's, it's, hugely and i get I where he was going the whole the whole district should be right right but that's friendly. what we say all the time right we put it up we have it we put it out there but there's no expectation that you know people attend and and we get we get small groups that attend and okay you know we make a difference with 20 people but you know it has to be a, a there has to be a system for people to follow you know some expectation or requirement dr brickson even said requirement I mean, he was talking about required professional development yeah. on customer service. And I like that Dr. Closey said, really specifying expectations, that this is not an option. Um, That's what I think, yes. I, I, I was really pleased to see Dr. Brinson and, his, and he was engaged as well as Dr. Webley. And right. I, they're working closely with, with um, those 14 schools. So I, I think for them to hear this conversation at this level was a meeting of substance that we're not just talking, what we're moving in a direction of actionable steps. And I, I think that was just, I thought I wrote it was- this down, but I didn't write down who said it. But the person who said cross-departmental review, I thought was just, Tracy. That was Tracy McManus. That is really what you're trying to do. And the fact that they're articulating that saying we could do it. And she gave a specific example of something you could do that with, but really that, that phrase cross departmental, um, I see as a really good sign. They're, they're, they're articulating that as a, um, Ron, you did a great job. You know, Ron, we, we go through this. What are we doing? How we, you know, we, <laughs> and then every out, time he nails it. Don't yeah. waste my time troubling me anymore, Ron, about how we got to roll this thing out. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It, it is a, a wonderful. You make it easy for me to do that. I'm curious what you thought about their words on the vision. I think they were, you know, I think since our lens is so parent-family engagement, you know, those are the words that 
um, I dream of every night, you know, so I think in layman's terms, I think that's where they were, you know, I mean, if I had never heard these words before, I would have been like, I got it. I got, I think that's where they were, you know, they were not jargony. But, but I don't, I, not only where they were, but it was almost like, well, I guess it's, I, I want to say it was almost like their emotional word to describe how they feel in their own work sometimes. You know, when you put something out there, you're thinking about it also as it relates to your own work. So if, you know, intentional, or if it means, you know, you need some more collaboration or trusting. It, it permeates across your entire work, not just family engagement. Mm -hmm. and we, like couldn't, we really couldn't be really truthful what we really could say because we still need our jobs. Right. <laughs> I, didn't, um, I didn't hear, at least outwardly, uh, and real pushback about this is going to be really a pain for educators. So that was not a theme I was hearing, which I thought was good. Um, and that well, when they used words like convenient or flexible as I probed, it was about convenient, flexible for families. Yeah, I'm glad we clarified that because I actually thought, I wondered if like Nancy, you know, was the one that put convenient and that she meant convenient for teachers, you know, but I, I'm glad you brought that up, Dr. Brim. So I did not hear that in their language or in their comments. And uh, Dr. Britson, I thought, uh, does he have the power to, to, does he have the power to say, we're gonna require, I mean, can, does he have enough um, social wow. capital in your district level to say, we will make these things required across all the buildings. This will happen, this should happen. I, I really liked when he was saying those things. I think um, not necessarily the all in power, but he's on the executive leadership team mm -hmm. where we keep pushing this conversation. We keep talking about this conversation. He works closely with principals. So he might not have the stamp to right. say it's going to take place, but he can push it where it really needs, where it needs to be. In the room where it could happen. Yes. Okay. And um, the other person, I, uh, uh, DeMor DeMoris? Yeah, was that DeMoris's first meeting? Should I have acknowledged him? I, 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 I put in the chat to him, I said, is this your first meeting? I'm so sorry I didn't acknowledge you, but he didn't reply. Anyway, he's through oh, no. strategic communications. I, um, I got a little confused because I was thinking, but it was the coffee hour. I think this might be his first meeting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Ben. I, I should have acknowledged him. That's okay, but he did participate, and yeah. uh, um, I, I love that. Before we even said it, and and uh, Dr. Brinson had not been part of this conversation before. He went to. We have to prepare staff throughout the district. <laughs> so critical. And I, that was that's what I wanted to speak to. I feel that you know that's the biggest part. I think we in the district office can collaborate as much as we want. If it is not, you know, funneling down into the schools, the school leaders, making sure that they are holding their staff accountable for this work. And I know this because with the work that I do with parent advocacy, you know, I, I get to hear both sides. I get to hear the frustration of the parents. I get to often hear the frustration of the principals, the teachers, mm -hmm. but everyone is doing just that. They're sharing their frustration. And I don't feel that a parent should necessarily be met with it. You know, when we signed up for this work, we know what comes along with it. We know the labor, how labor intensive it is. We know that this year especially is very challenging, but we have to rise to what, you know, we basically took our own personal oath to say we're going to do, which is meeting the families where they are, making sure the students are learning and they are successful and achieving. Um, and I can't say that that's necessarily what we're seeing happen. So I love the work that we're doing. I just, what Dr. Brinson said is so true. The, the family friendly training that our office does, it has to penetrate throughout the entire school. It cannot, can't just happen on the, the front office level. I think that's a sprout needs to take place. 
that's, and that's a fan, and that's exactly where you have to start. I think you're absolutely right. I again, though, this is where we can hope that Dr. Webley can help with this. Yes. Um, that it has got to go beyond relationship and then instructional and then people see the partnership as a resource to support their learning. So um, the, the relationship is loud and clear coming through. We, we've got to get those um, oh, perfect. people who can affect okay. what um, does calling or email work for you better? in terms of the learning okay, piece. So hold on. So what else is when you say I love that Dr. Colosi Youth that were laying out the expectations, and I don't know—is that a common thing? I mean, is she unusual in that way? But I think, and and I think you mentioned, Dr. Brem, the evaluation. If this were part of that process, where there is a stem around that, and you have some indicators of what success looks like, and it becomes part of what is um, evaluated regularly, that that would change a lot. Um, so, getting the right things to look at, the right points to say. Do teachers do these things? What would it to change or, or amend or um, enhance the evaluation process in the district? Who, who would decide that? Well, it's part of their evaluation in, in the um, eye observation that they have to connect to families. We, about a couple of years ago, we developed a rubric Mm -hmm. where teachers can do a self-assessment mm -hmm. and look at different levels where you are as far as um, those domains. Right. We asked them to use that rubric, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think they did. Um, you remember that class, effective classroom rubric we put together that talked about if you was a one, two, three, this is what it will look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a right combination of stuff from Scholastic and stuff from Flamboyant. Yes. Yeah. So what's interesting, Dr. Brim, I think you, you really uh, hit on a really effective method that if that became a real part of evaluation where folks had to show evidence of that mm -hmm. and principals actively looked for that. Um, I shared with Sheila the other day, and I don't know if she shared this with you, I have a project I'm doing in a district where they they put a measure online into a dashboard that principals could see and the administrators could see at the central office. And the fact that somebody was looking at this made so much happen, it is unbelievable. So having that system that, you know, where, where does that boil up that someone's looking at and saying, hey, that's not happening in these two buildings, that needs to happen there. That accountability system around that is, uh, is potentially so powerful. And that's why I was glad, Dr. Brim, you brought up about um, evaluation, but it's got to be something. And, and we didn't hear the data guy talk much today. No, I, I was just thinking that, that we hadn't heard from Dan the whole time. He was going to talk. He didn't have his camera on, so he might have, you know, been consumed with some other things. But what I wanted to ask him in particular was, and I think we'll get there, is what does that system look like for reporting up on this? How, how could you have a system that had two or three key measures uh, whatever it might be, um, you know, is there a dashboard, for example, that tells me by building how many teachers have are, I don't know if the three is good or the one is good, but are at level three on that indicator, you know, and that there's evidence. And so 